All right, folks, welcome back to chapter 16. This is part two. Last time we talked uh, a bunch of definitions about uh, streams and their different features um, and uh, talked about erosion and transportation. Uh, ended up talking about capacity and competence. Just to remind you again, uh, capacity, again, is the maximum amount of material that a stream can carry, and it's directly related to volume essentially of the stream discharge the greater the discharge the greater the capacity of the stream and then we also talk competence which is the maximum size particle that can be transported so the faster the flow larger particles so competence is directly related to velocity of the stream on the other end of things we have deposition right so as uh, the stream slows uh, both its competence is reduced, right? So larger, larger sediments start to drop out, the bigger ones first. As this competence gets less and less, you start to filter out smaller and smaller particles. Right? When you hit base level for uh, the stream, that would be the local base level or ultimate base level, uh, in the case of a, a stream that empties directly into the ocean, uh, what happens is, you know, you come out of that channelized stream and the water spreads out, velocity drops, energy drops, right, and then sedimentation occurs, the remaining sediments occur. And what you see here is a false color image, it's not this pretty if you fly over it, but this is the Mississippi River Delta. So here's the Mississippi River coming out into the Gulf of Mexico, and then as you see, once it comes out, everything spreads out. Right, and then we get lots of deposition. And what you're seeing here are beautiful, what we call braided rivers. They come and go, and, and, and uh, uh, they're very um, um, easily eroded. They're just, you know, sediment that's being deposited and little streams created in there. So one time you see it, they'll be over here. Next time they'll be over here, over here, right? The channels of these streams are, are very easily eroded. They interfinger, they intertwine with each other. All right, and this is very common to see when you hit the base level of a, a stream. So what occurs uh, when you hit the base level is you get uh, a wedge-shaped structure as, as it comes out of the channelized sediment, right, or the channel, and, uh, and spreads out, energy drops, velocity drops, competence drops, right? So everything drops out. If this happens in water, we call it a delta. Uh, if it happens on land outside a mountain front, usually, it's called an alluvial fan. Right? So here we see again, the last picture I showed you was the false color image of the Mississippi River and its delta. Here's just a little cartoon drawing of it, uh, showing you at different times, starting with time one, then time two, time three, time four, five, six, and now seven, where the, uh, the different deposition has been occurring along this broad um, delta, their deltaic fan. Right? So as it evolves, this kind of river moves back and forth, the fan moves back and forth uh, along its own sediments and, and builds out this big, beautiful delta. So here it is in all of its glory uh, in the wild here. You see the beautiful meandering river in the background in its here is its stream valley, and it's on a beautiful channel. But once it comes out of this, this stream valley and comes into this, this base level here, which happens to be uh, ocean, it looks like in this case, or a big lake, uh, it spreads out, right? Velocity drops, and you cause all this sedimentation here. Uh, and then you get these beautiful braided streams. Again, they kind of interfinger with each other. They come, they go. These are very, very common to see on deltas and on alluvial fans. An alluvial fan, like I mentioned, uh, occurs uh, generally outside of mountain fronts, uh, but wherever you come out of a steep area, into a flat kind of slope. So again, come down of a steep area down to this flat slope. What happens when you come out of this, this canyon, this channel, again, the energy spreads out, velocity drops, competence is reduced, and you start to deposit stuff. And as you can see here, this is dry at the moment, but you can see these beautiful braided rivers, braided streams, sorry, um, uh, all over the sides of this alluvial fan. You see, notice this canyon here, another alluvial fan formed there, and they kind of uh, um, uh, met together here. 
Here's an image of the alluvial fan on Mars, not this. This is just a, a meteorite impact into the alluvial fan. But as you see, the same thing we see over here, you have a, a, a nice channelized stream. And as it comes out of that canyon onto a flat, we get deposition because energy dissipates, it spreads out, we drop velocity and drop competence. So here's a, another, you know, pretty uh, uh, good piece of evidence that there once was flowing water on Mars. And look, you can even see traces of those little braided rivers uh, in the fans there. Uh, another thing that occurs right on the edge of the channel uh, when you get a flood in a nice, uh, you know, meandering river setting like our Grand River here in Michigan, all right, once we get into flood stage and water comes out of the channel and spreads out, now again, once it spreads out, Velocity is reduced, competence is reduced, and right as you come out of the channel, the velocity and competence is reduced enough that you cause deposition of sands, you know, generally coarser to medium and fine sands, right on the edge of the channel. Uh, and that is called a natural leverage. Generally, it builds up just a little bit uh, of, of, a, of a slope on the edge of the channel. All right, and then you get between the channel and natural levee, and the, the wall here, you get what's called the back swamp, which is where, you know, you'll often see, even when it gets just a little floody, these things are full. Right? And it's because there's kind of a bowl or, or a, a, a basin formed between this little natural levee and the, uh, the edge of the flood point. So how do streams create their own valleys, their own floodplains? Uh, I, I mentioned that they do this uh, themselves, and it actually is through the combined processes of erosion and of deposition co-occurring uh, during um, uh, the, the life cycle of a meandering stream. And the combined effect, I mean erosion on the out cut banks or the outside of the stream channel Right? and deposition on the inside of the stream channel. And how does this work? If you think about it, uh, think about going around on a circle or, you know, if you're on a, um, um, a Ferris wheel, right? If you're at the center of the Ferris wheel, you're not really spinning that fast. But if you're on the outside of the Ferris wheel or, say, merry-go-round, you're spinning a lot faster because you have a lot further distance to cover that arc, right? So the water on the outside of the channel is flowing faster than it is on the inside of the channel. And faster water tends to have a higher um, competence, and that tends to cause erosion. So you get erosion on the outside edge, and you see here, this outside edge is actually eroding and eating into the valley wall itself, and that's how uh, streams tend to erode, uh, tend to widen their own valley walls. But at the same time, on the inside curve here, we have the slowest water, so the fastest water is on the outside, the slowest is on the inside, and as this is on the inside curve, we get deposition. So slowest water, lower velocity, lower competence, deposition. Right? And these occur at what we call meanders or bends in the river. Right? Um, so what happens, or tends to happen, if you have erosion on the outside and deposition on the inside, it tends to migrate these meander meander bends in the direction of its bending so this one's going to tend to migrate this way and eat further into the valley wall this one's going to tend to migrate this way now eventually they get too squiggly and they'll end up getting cut off maybe in a flood or something the river will take a little bit uh, you know faster path and some of these get cut off talk about that in a few minutes uh, but again these meanders as they as they move around right cutting on the outside edge depositing on the inside edge they tend to to work together to create the nice flat floodplain and to widen the valleys itself i'll show you this here an example of meandering stream development so here we see just you know happy kind of straight narrow stream this is what you might see say coming out of a mountain canyon right where it's cut deep into a, a v-shaped valley uh, cut by the river but as it comes out into the plains it's going to start to meander back and forth right cutting on the outside edge depositing on the inside edge and as it meanders back and forth and wiggles through this floodplain it moves you know creates its own uh, floodplain and eats its own valley walls 
here's some of those features we see here, right? So now we have a uh, an oxbow lake. This is an old cutoff meander scar that's filled with water, right? So this was an old meander bend once the river was over here at one point. All right, we got cut off. Now it's moved over here. Here's again showing you a, a detailed, you know, close up of that meander bend where it's cutting on the outside and depositing on the inside. Right? Now let's say we have something uh, occur. We either have a, a sea level change, so uh, sea level drops, or or land rises. Either case, both have actually happened here in Michigan. Well, not sea level, but. Lake Michigan levels have changed and fluctuated, and that changes basically the local base level and can change the profile. So what happened, and also uh, after uh, the last ice age, you know, about 20,000 years ago, there was, say, oh, a mile deep of ice on top of us, uh, and that causes a lot of weight, and that actually depressed the crust, and now that that weight is gone, you know, the crust is actually rising in what we call isostatic rebound we'll discuss that more in a couple chapters but the land here in Michigan actually is going up and that causes often what we see uh, uh, a second development so there we get uplift and then a new base level causes the river to cut down to a lower system and then it again wiggles back and forth co-occurrence of deposition and erosion widening the valley wall All right and now we see Here's the old floodplain. Here's the new current lower floodplain. This old floodplain, this is called a uh, alluvial terrace, right? So this is a terrace, right? Different terraces. Um, um, those show different elevations at which the uh, floodplain and river, therefore, used to be. Right? We see again back swamps, a very common feature behind uh, rivers. Don't build your house in a back swamp. Uh, meander scars, oxbow lakes, old cutoff um, um, meander bends that have been filled with water. Let's see again, here's an example of flooding. So sediment deposited and right next to here we get a natural levee forming. Here's a, a good uh, example of how a levee forms. So you notice just this gentle slope uh, coming off the river channel. This is a natural levee formed by, uh, as the river floods, you get that immediate drop in velocity and the immediate drop in competence that deposits kind of coarse sediments right against the valley or right against the river channel, right? You see sort of coarse sediments being deposited, right? Now we're going to use this and take this idea to an extreme in our own man-made or artificial levee systems, uh, such as you hear about down in New Orleans, the ones that broke in Katrina. We'll discuss that in the next video here. So we might be wondering why do streams have to have curved paths. Well, one reason is fluids could not flow in a straight line. Well, let me clarify. If there was no such thing as friction, fluids could flow in a straight line, but there's obviously friction, right? The sides of the channels cause friction, so there's more friction along the edges and the bottom of the channel than there is in the center, and that causes a turbulence or disturbance of the water, right? And what we see, right, like if you were in a tube, Right, everybody's all in the tube, and you're tied off like a like an octopus to the beer tube in the center, floating down in the summer. Good stuff, right? But what you'll notice is you don't always stay in the center of the river, right? So as you go down this river, right, what you see is you'll be bouncing along with that kind of the fastest flow or the highest velocity. So you'll be bouncing towards those outside edges, even though, you know, the nice sandy beach where you want to have a picnic is right on the inside edge. So you always got to paddle back over to it, right? But you'll flow towards the outside edge, right? So fastest flow of the water again on the outside of the curve. That's where we have a cut bank. That's where we cause erosion. The inside of the curve has the slowest 
uh, deposition. But it's also interesting to note that, you know, not only is it slow on the inside of the curve, but the water is actually doing a turbulent kind of rolling motion as it goes around these curves due to the friction again uh, in the water. So again, not as it just the fastest water on the outside, but also it's getting, you know, there's a lot of the, uh, the material that's being eroded off the edges there is then being kind of scooped up and swirled and deposited uh, uh, on the inside or point bar of these curves. So again, water moves in a rolling motion around these meander bends. So here's an example of a, a meander bend, right? So here's the, the point bar where we have deposition. You can see all the sandy deposition occurring. Right? Here is where your house has become the cut bank, right? Or your apartment complex, right? You can see that here they maybe had a little bit too close of a, of a, a lakeside or riverside view, right? This is, uh, you know, happened during likely a large flooding or storm event, which is when we get of course, the you know most erosion and transportation of material, uh, but that is a hazard. Right? Cut bank, yeah, point bar on the inside. Right? Here's another example. This happened during just one flooding event. All right, so here's originally the cut bank. Right, this is where we have the erosion. Fastest water, right, gets on the outside of the curve, and then there it is. Right again. A little too close to the uh, to the river now edge, right? You're gonna have to pick up the house and move it back, and that's what we're seeing here in Michigan, just because of you know high lake levels as well. Right? Here's another big beautiful point bar developed. You can see another beautiful cut bank on the outside of the uh, the uh, the stream bend there. So a couple different uh, types of meandering. Here we have one that's you know, very common to see around here in Michigan. And here we have, you know, a nice, beautiful meandering river. And again, look at these beautiful point bars on the outside or the inside of the curve, excuse me, beautiful point bars on the inside of the curve, cut banks on the outside, all right? But uh, here we notice if we have a flood in this in this area, there's a lot of floodplain for this, uh, this extra water to cover. So in this area, which is what we have around here called lowland type areas, we have big broad floodplains. Generally we're dealing with a lot larger volumes of water than we are in say high mountainous areas uh, where they get flash floods or upland floods. But here we have you know, this big broad floodplain for all this water to spread over before it starts to rise. Here's another example, and this is Horseshoe Bend, I believe, down in uh, Utah. And you see this is the Colorado River down here, and it's incised very deeply because, again, the land around here is uplifting, so it's just cutting down really deeply. And if you notice, there's not much in this canyon as far as floodplain, right? So the water, if they have a flood on this river, the only place the water has to go really is, is up. Here's an example of a beautiful oxbow lake. As you can see pretty easily, the river used to come this way, right? And then go back through, around, and back this way. But likely during, you know, a flooding or storm event, it decided, well, not decided, you know what I mean, that it needed a, 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 a straighter path. So it uh, eroded through and, and pinched this one off. Here's another example, and you can really see dramatically in this one. Here's the current river channel carrying a lot of suspended sediment, right? A lot of suspended load. And here's an old oxbow lake, and you can tell the water in here is much clearer because it's now a lake, not a river, and it doesn't have a current. So the suspended sediment has time, time to, to settle out. But as you can see here, it's all used to go this way, right? And this became a very, very tight uh, bend, as you notice on this side we would have had an old an old point bar deposition, right, and then cutting on the outside. Here we would have had an old point bar deposition cutting on the outside. It almost essentially pinched itself off in this case. And you can see over here that is in fact uh, ha currently happening to this oxbow lake, which is still slightly connected to the river right here. You can see, but it's almost pinched off, and this would be a inside of a curve from this 
you know, river used to flow this way. So this would have been an inside of a curve. This would have been an inside of a curve. And we get deposition, 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 and eventually just kind of pinched itself off. This stream itself has a lot of these little oxbow lakes and former meander scars that you can see all over. Again, just showing you how these point bars develop and eventually end up kind of pinching off these, these old uh, meander bends and leaving them as oxbow lakes. Here's another just beautiful picture of um, a nice big floodplain, valley walls. You can see very clearly in different color here. Beautiful meandering stream. I don't really see any uh, oxbow lakes here, but you can just drastically see from the contrast in colors, you know, where the floodplain has developed uh, or not on as far as uh, uh, this river is concerned. So as a river develops, right, close to the source in, in upland areas where we have kind of steep, uh, steep uh, uh, um, uh, uh, mountains or, or, you know, high angles, what we're talking about is streams that have, you know, maybe not so much volume, so they wouldn't have so much capacity, but they do have a lot of velocity, so they can carry large type particles. But uh, either way, in these in the mountainous upstream areas close to the source, we tend to get these, these V-shaped valleys as the river cuts down and mass wasting widens the side. Primarily what we get here is erosion. Closer to the base level, all right, we start to form these nice, beautiful meandering streams. Now they've come out of these big mountain canyons, these V-shaped canyons, and they're able to spread out and start to eat and develop, right? Their, or eat, I'm sorry, to, uh, erode and, and develop their own floodplain by the processes of co-erosion and deposition, as we just discussed, right? And then we see, you know, again, uh, nice big this might be you know very close to you know grand river style here big broad black, uh, flood plain uh nice valley defined valley walls beautiful you know meander bends and this is what we see kind of around around here again just kind of showing that as a, the anatomy of a stream as we come from you know up upland areas or the you know kind of headwaters of a stream and let's just say something that you know like the colorado river where it starts off in the mountains right and we get steep angles high velocity lots of uh, erosion steep v-shaped valleys all right but as we come out of there into the plains right now we suddenly go from a steep angle into a flat area and we suddenly come out of these channelized areas right spread out onto this big flat, uh, flat valley right and then we get uh, deposition of alluvial fan systems with these braided river channels right again just because once we dropped uh, once we spread out, we drop velocity, we drop competence, and cause deposition, right? Further beyond that, that's when we start to see our nice meandering streams formed, our beautiful wide stream valleys cut again by the, the stream itself, right? Here's a little oxbow lake just to show you. And then down at the uh, base level of the stream, whether it be, you know, Lake Michigan here for uh, the Grand River or um, you know, like the Mississippi River emptying into uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, again, you come out of that channelized area and you spread out into a larger volume of water. Again, you drop velocity, you drop energy, and you cause deposition. And again, we see these beautiful braided river systems forming. But this time, instead of calling them an alluvial fan, as we do coming out of the mountains, we call them a delta. Just to remind you about drainage networks and drainage basins, we discussed them just a little bit last time. Uh, and I did mention that, you know, a drainage basin, watershed, entirely the same, interchangeable word there. Uh, how you define it really depends on, on what you're studying. So here, for example, we have uh, the Yellowstone River drainage basin. We could also define a drainage basin for the Bighorn River or any of the little tributaries of that. But the Yellowstone River itself is, or Yellowstone River drainage basin itself, is part of the Missouri River drainage basin. 
but the Missouri River drainage basin is part of the Mississippi River drainage basin, right? So again, depending on what you're studying, what you're looking at, that's how you're going to define your drainage basin. Right? Drainage networks, on the other hand, are how water flows through a system or flows through individual drainage basins. And just to kind of show you here, here is the drainage network for the Great Lakes themselves. The highest part is Lake Superior, right? So that's the highest of our Great Lakes, also the deepest of our Great Lakes. But that goes from Lake Superior, uh, the drainage network goes through the St. Mary's River into Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, those are the same lake. Again, if you don't believe me, up north there's a bridge you can drive across. If you look to one side, it's Lake Michigan, you look to the other side, it's Lake Huron. All right, from there through the St. Clair River, into Lake St. Clair, out the Detroit River, into Lake Erie, all right, over the Niagara River, drops over Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario, and then eventually into the St. Lawrence River and out into the Atlantic Ocean. And that is our drainage network for the Great Lakes themselves. All right, folks, that ends it for video number two. Next time we'll finish up with discussing flooding and flooding mitigation techniques. See you soon.